Usually Pastor Harrison has a stand to read the text, but I feel like I got to give myself a little bit of a context here before I get into the word this morning. Is that okay? Okay, so like Pastor Christy Harrison said, my name is Sydney. Um, I'm 22 years old. I've been at Kingdom Church for about five years now. And honestly, like, it's been hard five years, but it's been the best five years of my life. Like, this church has been such a blessing. And for these last five years, I've been led by the incredible, wonderful Pastor Christy and Harrison. Um, Kingdom team, like, those of you that serve here, like, you guys know the blessing that these, these people are on our lives. Just their obedience and their willingness to just, yeah, put their put their vulnerability in their lives and just, like, give it, give it to all to God. And so let's just give them a hand this morning because they're just amazing. So thank you guys so much just for, for everything that you've done for me and, and this opportunity. I just feel really blessed this morning. I'm also engaged to the amazing man, Chase, right here, front row. He's my friend, my fiance, my sermon editor. He's the, the whole package. So, so also, if you've been coming here for a bit, you might know my parents attend here. So Roger and Heather, they're some awesome, amazing people. So as you know, because you know, if you know them, I was raised in a Christian home. And it's kind of ironic, even just like saying this, but like I was raised in a Christian home and I still grew up with this like, like thought in my head that people who grew up in a Christian home are just really boring. And they have like these really boring stories and they, like I literally remember sitting in church at like probably 10 and this man was getting baptized. He'd like lived this crazy life and then came to know Christ. And I like whispered to my mom and I was like, I wish I was a born again Christian. Like, and like... <laughs> 10 years old, not understanding the gift that it is to, to be raised by Christian parents. But, I mean, it's funny, like, that's a funny story, but I think it, like, kind of sets the scene for, like, my story of not really believing that my testimony had power. And so, yeah, from, like, a really young age, I feel like there was a war on the power of my testimony. And I came across this, this verse um, probably about a year ago, and I've just been, like, just sometimes it takes a year to unpack a verse. But it says... They conquered the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimonies. And there's so much here, but, like, I think first and foremost, like, this is from Revelation 14. And, like, the fact that the blood of the lamb, which is Jesus' sacrifice, and the word of our testimony are in the same sentence. Like, I feel like that should kind of draw our attention a little bit. And so why wouldn't the enemy kind of come for that, right? And so I've just been, like, even preparing the sermon and kind of preparing my story, I was like, ah, oh, that's kind of lame. I was like, that's not that relatable, like. I just kind of had to push back. And so I think the enemy really hates it when we push back. So I cried like probably a thousand tears this week. Like, Chase, what if it's boring? What if they don't like it? And I just think that like... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I just think there's power in, in sharing our, our story. So I'm going to go first. And then you guys have to go share your stories with your friends after this. So I'm going to start in John 5, verse 1 to 9. Um, amazing. So all of the holy people with your physical Bibles, why don't you pull it out? You're welcome. I'm letting you sit. Um, so if you don't have your Bibles with you, it's okay. The text is going to be on the screen. But it says, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five co covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to be healed? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. So this morning, I want to call our sermon, Do You Want to Be Healed? Can we just give it up for the Lord this morning? So as I said, I'm going to share a little bit of my story. And kind of like the beginning of my like school career, it was really hard. I grew up and I experienced a lot of bullying. And I ended up switching schools and starting again and I, I kind of had this picture, like, oh, it's a fresh start. I'm going to start again. So I remember, like, I put my backpack on. I'm leaving my grade three classroom. There's, like, I can see my bully in the corner. I'm just like, got to get out of here. And I remember telling people, because I, I missed the last three weeks of school. I remember telling people that I was going on a scrapbooking vacation with my mom. 
And I'm like, some people deserve to be bullied, man. Like, <laughs> but <laughs> it's funny, but like as time went on and I, and I began to like realize the depth of how this was affecting me, I kind of realized that it had, it had created an identity wound in me. It's really hard to say that after I made that joke because that was pretty funny. But it did, it, it created an identity wound in me and it ended up like affecting my friendships going forward because there was always a fear that it would end up the same way. And, uh, sorry, I keep on pressing. Okay, yeah, so it resulted in deep pain, and as my school career kept on going into junior high, it resulted in a lot of, like, anxiety and depression. And so, at the end of junior high, my parents are kind of noticing that there's something wrong. I'm kind of, like, not myself. Maybe, whether it's, like, in my room watching Grey's Anatomy with the windows drawn and, like, being really sad, or whatever it is, like, just the first kind of signs of depression. I was pretty lost, and... As hard as it is to understand, like, I grew up in church, but I really didn't know Jesus. And so I think I had this, like, facade of, um, of community or whatever it was. I just, I was in a lot of pain. And so finding that out in grade nine, I'm sure if there's any girls in the room, junior high, not the time, not a good time, not a, not a fun time at all. And so I get into high school and I'm kind of, again, like, oh, hope that things are going to get better, right? And then I get to high school and things kind of get worse and then there's boys involved and there's heartbreak involved and then there's this thing called partying that people start doing and I'm like I want to know I want to know what that is and so I start partying I start drinking don't tell my parents and and I just like there was these nights where I would drink and I would, I would just feel a little bit better like the pain would just subside for like an hour and it kind of honestly it was kind of enough for me like a little bit of a little bit of um pain management going on, and so obviously my parents weren't super happy about that, so they're like, you should try this thing called therapy, so <laughs> started going to therapy, I, I remember every Thursday night, bless their wallets, at like 4 or 7 p.m., I would go to therapy, and I would like vent, and then I would go get my sad girl Starbucks, and go on my sad girl drive, and listen to my sad girl music, and weirdly enough, like this melancholic feeling that I like entered into, it kind of was like whether it was relief or just like, woe is me, like there was a little bit of pain relief there too for me. But then I'd wake up Friday morning and be like, uh-oh, now I have to wait another week before I feel a little bit better. Or I could drink on Saturday night. And so like these patterns that I was getting myself into, not only were they super temporary, they were also forming new wounds, right? Because I would do things at parties and I'd wake up and I'm like, oh, you're so dumb. And like, yeah, they're just these these things that I were, was going to that were just creating more wounds. And so e today, even if my story isn't relatable for you, maybe you, like, were a way better kid than me, or maybe you were really a lot worse kid than me, like Chase. Um, <laughs> his parents are here, I can say that. But regardless if this is, like, directly relatable to you or not, we all have pain. We're all lost and in need. And all of us have a sickness in our souls, and we want to feel better, right? We, we want to feel better. And I think whether it's for the Christian who grew up in a, in a Christian home or for the person who's your first time in church this morning, sometimes shame just makes that even worse. Because it's like, oh, I don't, I don't want anyone to know about it. Like, I don't want to tell anyone. And then the shame just begins to build and compound, and then it creates more wounds and more pain. And so I tell this because I think it's a little bit relatable to the text. So we're going to go back to John 5, 1, and I'm just going to... Help us form a picture of what's going on here. Is that okay? Okay, so John 5, 1 says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five co covered colonnades. Okay, so when you're reading the Bible, I feel like you're one of two people. And I feel like I'm, I'm, I kind of switch, depending on the day. But either you, you've, already, like, you've already just tuned out for this whole thing. Like you just skipped over this part because it's like I don't, know, I don't know what any of that means. Or you like the other version of me, which is also kind of annoying. You dive into this and then you spend an hour in the morning with six commentaries in your lap figuring out what the heck a sheep gate is. And then you don't even get to the meat of the text. And so the first time I preached this through, Chase was like, nobody cares that much about the sheep gate. And I was like, Aaron Mumby for sure cares about the sheep gate. <laughs> so, so basically, I'm going to summarize this as quick as I can without nerding out, okay? But stay with me. We're in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a Jewish city. We're at the temple. We're at a body of water. And 
Some of your guys' Bibles, you might have it on your phone, the translation. Some of them say that an angel would come and stir up the water. It's kind of unclear. I'm not going to get into it. I'm going to do my best. Um, but basically, the, 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 sorry, the thing about this pool is that even if it is true that it provided healing, the healing was conditional, right? Because it's first come, first serve. It's, I got to get there first. I got to be the first one in. And I think about, like, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Mere Lake. I don't know why. It, it's not a man-made lake, but in the middle of the lake, there's just, like, a fountain that, like, springs. I'm like, who is, who is going into the middle of the lake and making the fountain? I don't know. Maybe I should know why that's there. But I think about it, and I'm like, it's, like, people sitting on the beach and, like, wait, like, just waiting to, like, be the first one in the water. And so... It's, it's kind of a weird thing, right? Like, this, is, this, is, this could be miraculous. And I was reading this text, and I was just thinking, like, like this, the pool itself is a miracle. And it just kind of reminded me of, like, the other weird things that are going on in the Bible. Like, Peter's shadow in the book of Acts. Like, it's fallen on people, and they're getting healed. Like, Paul's handkerchief. You're telling me that this guy would blow his nose, and then, like, later it got, like, passed around, and it would heal people. And just weird things, weird things going on. You touch, a, like, a guy's bones, and people got healed. Basically what I'm saying is miracles do happen, right? We see miracles throughout the Bible. Um, and what we need to understand foundationally about this pool was that it was probably all the hope this man had left. And so I don't know if you guys are familiar with the show The Chosen, but they do a rendition of this passage. And it's kind of a time lapse of this paralytic man, and he's just like, every single day when it, when it bubbles up, he's just going. Like, he's pulling himself on his forearms every day, probably like getting like bloody and, and like a lot of pain in his forearms too. And it's just like, it's so hopeless to watch him in this time lapse just age and probably get harder and harder for him to, to get there. And I imagine him making his way to this pool every single time just to be beat out by someone else. And so this thing that was like the crux of his hopelessness, or sorry, the crux of his hope was actually just furthering his hopelessness. It was failing him time after time. And so just going back to my story, after learning about this condition, this anxiety and depression, like I said, I started therapy. And I, I feel like it's common to seek therapy now. Like in our, our, our parents' generation was kind of like, like, I feel bad because it was just like, we don't talk about it. Like we don't talk about that you're sad. And, and for us, it's just like, we have therapy. But, and I don't think therapy is bad. Don't hear me wrong. Like me going to therapy isn't inherently wrong. Just like I don't think going to relationships or church or a spouse is the wrong place to go with your pain. But I was looking to be healed by this and leaving even more hopeless than I was when I showed up. So let me, yeah, like I, I just feel like, I feel like maybe you relate to that, right? Like maybe it's a new job. Maybe it's a relationship, a friendship, a new medication. Maybe it's a new church. Maybe you found Kingdom Church and you're like, this is the one. This is the one that's going to heal me. This is the one that's going to fix all my church hurt. And can I just say there's grace for a sick heart that is seeking for healing. But despite the grace, these things aren't our solution. These things aren't where we're going to find freedom and healing. Maybe it's a 6'2", curly-haired man who's getting down on one knee. But then the next day he hurts your feelings, right? And I think, like, when I was writing this part of my sermon, I, I don't want to give the impression that we don't go to people with our pain. But I think we, we um, pay attention to the weight that which they're, we're giving them in our life. And so my point here is that counterfeit avenues of healing become roadblocks in our journey to experiencing the fullness of Christ. Let me say that again. Oh, good. Okay, cool. Counterfeit avenues of healing become roadblocks in our journey to experience the fullness of Christ. And I think this is hard with the good things, right? Like... I went to chapters and I bought a self-help book. I've been to church every Sunday this month. How is this a counterfeit avenue? Like I'm doing the things that I'm, I'm supposed to be doing, aren't I? Maybe you bought the new John Mark Homer practicing the way book. <laughs> but does that resonate? Like, am I not doing enough? And I think when we place the weight of our pain on a relationship, a career, or medication, we often find ourselves more hopeless and discouraged than when we began. And this is a hard place to be. And I imagine it's where this man at the pool was at, right? So continuing on in verse 5, it says, One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Just think about it. Like, I had, like, five years of, like, pretty intense depression and anxiety, and that felt like it got hopeless. 38 years of not being the first one to the pool. When Jesus saw him lying there, 
and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to be healed? Or do you want to get well? What an unusual question, right? Like, I don't, we don't have a picture of the Bible of what this man's condition is, but I imagine he's dirty and he's got blood on his forearms and he's, he's probably not fed well, so he's, he, he obviously looks like he isn't doing well. But why would Jesus ask him this question? The first time I read this, I kind of thought, does Jesus just, like, is this like a divine knowledge moment where he knows something that we don't? But, like, who else might have been a little bit offended by this question? So I go to therapy semi-regularly now. (laughs) Not every Thursday at 7 p.m. And if you know me, you know I love this woman, okay? My therapist. Like, I tell Chase and Kendra that I want her to tuck me in at night. Like, (laughs) she just, like... (laughs) <laughs> she's the perfect balance between, well, she's not perfect, come on. But, like, she's a great balance between making me feel seen and heard, but I don't walk away feeling like, I just got enabled for an hour. You know, and, like, obviously she's team Sydney. Like, I told her, like, I asked her if I could bring Chase one time. She's like, sure, but he's just going to feel outnumbered. Um, but, like, but genuinely, like, I will not go to someone who speaks poorly of my significant other because it's not helpful to anyone. It's not. It's not helpful for me to, like, grow my pride for an hour and then be like, well, my therapist said. And, okay, so this is a side note, but if you're, like, you're in a relationship and you're going to a friend, whether it's, like, a a significant other that you're having issues with or a friendship, and you go to a friend and this friend is like, well, Chase is the source of your your problem, or so-and-so is the source of your problem, or, you know what I mean? Like, we don't go to people like that. We don't go to people that speak poorly of the person that we need, we need wisdom for. And I just think, yeah, sorry, this is a side note, but I mentioned this passage to her that I was preaching on John 5 and just how strange I thought this question was and like I just kind of said it in passing and she just kind of like, she just stood there and I could tell like she didn't want to share too much but she just said, Sydney, day in and day out I see patients and I often have the same question, right? And I I don't know if if she's actually sitting there and she's as bold as Jesus and she's like, do you want to be be healed? You're paying like $200 an hour. Um... But, I mean, for a therapist to commit her life to helping people and, and she has to ask this question, like, I, it's still a problem. Like, this isn't a problem 2,000 years ago and now we still have the problem. And don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that this man didn't want to get healed because it seems like he was pretty eager. But I do think that hopelessness can mark our souls. Hopelessness can mark our souls in a way that if, if the pool was, like, the image of healing for us for so long, if something else comes along, like... The hopelessness has already marked us. It's already affected our hope. And I think when we get committed to a counterfeit avenue of just feeling a little bit better, it just becomes pain management. So we see this man's question, or sorry, we see his answer, and he doesn't even really answer the question, right? Like he says, do you want to be healed? And then the man says, sir, I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm trying to get in, someone else always goes down ahead of me. And I think this can often be our answer, right? Like, I read the book. It just didn't hit, like, how I thought it was going to read, or how I thought it was going to hit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do when I'm not at church. I'm a psychology student, just like every other 22-year-old girl, (laughs) somehow. And I'm in this class called Social Psychology, and we've just been talking about, like, yeah, just the societal effects on, on human beings. And we learned about something called the sunk cost fallacy. Does anyone know what this is? So this, this phrase is often associated with gambling, but I think it's pretty applicable to a lot of us. And it says, the sunk cost fallacy is a tendency for people to continue an endeavor or course of action even when abandoning it would be more beneficial. Because we have, in, because we have invested our time energy or other resources, we feel that it would all have been for nothing if we quit. So we we kind of understand it. We put all of this stuff into something. We know that it's not good. We know that it's not benefiting us, but it's, it's too late to pull out now, right? It's too late to go back. I have such a good example for this. It just made me so mad. I was at a friend's house a couple weeks ago. Carol, I love you. I don't know if you're here, but she made me watch the movie 2012. You've seen that movie. You know no one finishes that movie. But we're like half an hour in and I'm ready, I'm ready to tap out. And her and Aaron are just like, we gotta, we gotta get through it. 
And you kind of just get to this point where you're like, well, I've already wasted half an hour, or I've already used up half an hour, so I may as well just finish. But it just doesn't make any sense, because you could have saved yourself an hour and a half of painful graphics. And yeah, it's funny, but like, as a result of feeling like we've invested so much time and it's too late, we make irrational or suboptimal decisions. And it's not just with, it's not just with movies, right? Like, I don't know, like maybe it's gambling, maybe it's blackjack, you're putting money down and then you're, I don't really know how it works super well, but you just, things aren't going good. <laughs> or investments or whatever it is, things that smarter people than me know about. Um, but I do this a lot. I do this when I'm writing papers. Like I get like two pages in and I'm like, I can't, I can't go back now. It's not a good topic, but I can't. And we do it with relationships, right? That's a hard one. Maybe it's a romantic relationship and, and you got into it in one stage of your life and now God's began to work on your heart and you're kind of like, this isn't good for me. This isn't a good place for me. And it's just like, but I've already put so much time in. I've already put so much effort in. And then I have to start again. It's hard. It's, it's hard to be in that place. And I think the things that we turn to in an effort to alleviate pain, some, yeah, like I said, sometimes they just create deeper wounds. Sometimes those are relationships that we're not ready to pull away from. They just continue to create deeper and deeper wounds. We have this picture that we're too far gone. Maybe this man came to a place where he felt like he'd invested so much time and effort into making his way to the pool in this one source of healing that it would feel foolish to abandon it when he feels like it's so close. And that's why I love The Chosen because I'm, I'm a visual person and to just see him day in and day out struggling and trying to get there. Like, like I wonder if he feels like he's getting better at it. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's kind of funny, but it's also not. Like, he's building his forearm muscles. He's getting stronger. He's getting more used to the terrain and, and how fast other people are. And, and you know what I mean? He's seeing other people succeed in it. He's seeing it work for other people. So why wouldn't he keep, he, why wouldn't he keep trying? Yeah, and I think we, we get into these scenarios where we just keep buying into something. And in, in the end, we leave angry and embarrassed and, and worse off than when we even began. And I think there's lots of us that get to this point that this man got at the pool. Well, you don't know how hard I've tried. You don't know how much time or money I've invested. You don't know how many doctors I've seen or medications I've tried. You don't know the depth of my pain. I've tried accountability. God, I'm trying. And I can only imagine Jesus looking at this man after he's answered the question this way and Jesus just thinking to himself, that's not what I asked. And if we know a little bit of Jesus, we don't know that, we, we know that it wasn't in a condemning or condescending way. It was more like, do you know what I have to offer? Do you know who I am? I'm the Lamb of God. I'm the one who came to take upon himself the sins of the world, the one who has loved you since before the world began. And to the person here this morning who does not yet know the love of Christ, let me tell you what he's done for you. There's a verse and it says, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, he was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Jesus came to this earth as a man to live a perfect life. He took your sins upon himself and he died a sinner's death so you could have a relationship with the Father. He rose again three days later and now is in heaven interceding on our behalf. And if that makes absolutely no sense to you, that's why we're here. Welcome to church. He died for you. And it, be, it may be hard to believe this right now, but he is more desperate for your healing than even you are. And I went back and forth about, about this part, but it, it hits. It hits deep. So we talked about the, the context of this pool, right? It's on the outside of the temple. It's in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a Jewish city, and people would come there to bring sin offerings. And so this... It, this pool that we're in, right, like it, it wasn't created for the invalids to lay there. It, it, had a, it had a different purpose. And the purpose for this pool, the reason it's called the Sheep Gate, 
is because people would travel from faraway cities with their sin offering, whether they carried it all the way there or they walked it there, and it's dirty. It's covered in mud or whatever terrain that they walked through. And because they weren't going to go to the altar and sacrifice a dirty lamb, they were supposed to be sacrificing a spotless lamb, they'd come to this pool and they'd clean the, the lamb, right? They'd clean it off in the pool. That was the purpose for it. And it just, it just hit me in a certain way when I thought about the fact that no one wants to come to this pool. Like, that's the reason that all of the invalids are there alone. The only people that are taking care of them, well, there's no one taking care of them, but they're just all there together. No one wants to come down there. No one wants to associate with the people that are paralyzed, lame, invalid. Maybe their families have abandoned them. Maybe their families have passed away. And they just don't have anyone to take care of them. Basically, what I'm saying is this is not a desirable place to hang out. The Jewish leaders aren't coming down there taking care of people. And so we know that this place is a place that people go to purify their lamb. And who do we see? The one person who's willing to come down to the pool and look at this man. The Bible tells us that Jesus is a spotless lamb. And I just, like, that just hit. Because we already know that God is good. We already know that Jesus is good because he's willing to heal this man. But he was also willing to be among the, all of the people that other people didn't want to associate with. He was willing to come alongside them. And there's this, this verse, and I'm going to read a paraphrased version of it because it's in Ezekiel, and Ezekiel is kind of hard to understand sometimes. But it says, for here, this is God, for, for here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you out of these countries, gather you from all over, and bring you back to your own land. I'll pour pure water over you and scrub you clean. I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I'll remove the stone heart from your body and replace it with a heart that's possible for you to do what I tell you and live by my commands. You'll once again live in the land I gave your ancestors. You'll be my people and I'll be your God. And I just think from this passage, what we're learning here is that God is not in the business of behavior modification. He's in the business of heart transformation. He's not sitting up there like, would you just get over it already? That was 10 years ago. How have you not found freedom from this yet? What is wrong with you? He's looking at you with his arms stretched out, and he's saying, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For some of us today, the first step is just the admission of our sickness. That, and that seems easy, like the self-awareness, but I feel like that's one of the hardest parts. Like I'm doing soul care with Kendra and Trish right now, and we just learned that if you don't have self-awareness, like... You can't go further than your self-awareness. You can't go further in your healing. Hang on. Your level of healing can never go deeper than your level of self-awareness. Am I willing to come forward and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you. I'm broken, I'm weary, and I need you. And the thing is, is that that admission comes from an invitation, right? Like Jesus invites us in. He says, come to me. So what's your response when Jesus says, do you want to be healed? Is it an excuse? Is it fear? Maybe a defense mechanism? I remember when Chase and I first started dating, and he would always ask me these really good seeking questions when he could tell there's something wrong. And my first response was just always to retreat, just always to be quiet and just hide. Yeah, I just think that sometimes the thought was like, is the risk of vulnerability worth it here? Like, but every time I trusted enough to open up, Chase met me with grace and understanding. And the best part is Chase isn't even Jesus. <laughs> Amen. And like I said, like he, he invites us, right? Like there's the invitation for vulnerability. But because God is a good father, he waits for our yes. So here's, here's this man's invitation, right? Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. 
At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. And just in this moment before he actually got up, I just like this call, like get up, pick up your mat and walk. I can't imagine how this must have felt, right? There's so many years of pain, so many moments of getting his hopes up just to get let down, just to be met with disappointment. And now there's this man. And he's offering something that makes his ears perk up. But what if it's just too good to be true? What if he, what if he starts to get up and he, and he has one shin on the ground and then he just stumbles and falls over and hurts himself more? Or he embarrasses himself in front of everyone? What if I start the journey? What if I start to surrender my life to Jesus and things just get harder? Or what if it just doesn't work? Like, what if, I'm the, what if I'm the exception? But what if that hole in your heart, that thing that's been plaguing you for so many years, maybe it was abuse from a parent, a friend, or a spouse, maybe you've been betrayed, maybe your parents abandoned you. What if Jesus could begin to make that not so hard? And I think that the difficult thing in this story is that we see a physical healing, right? And I think it's amazing. Like, Jesus can heal things. Jesus can make the lame walk. He can make the blind see. But that's not even the most interesting thing about him. It's not. I think sometimes, like, I don't know about you guys, but I've gone on a missions trip, and I've seen, like, physical healing happen. And I'm like, whoa, like, that is a faith builder for sure. But I think the scary thing is that we can be healed and full on the outside and still be so broken on the inside. And so what I want to talk about is that this isn't the story of the invalid. This isn't the story of the paralyzed man who can't make it into the water. This is a story about Jesus. This story isn't even about the man's physical healing. It's about there being an answer to our sin problem. It's about there being an answer to the distance between us and God. Jesus' presence alone is healing. It's healing for our hearts and our minds. It's healing for the places that we never wanted anyone to see. But even that, like the places that we don't want anyone to see, like God, God can see it already, but he's not, gonna, he's not gonna barge in, right? Like we have to invite him into those places. And there's this, there's this, part in Acts 3 when the Apostle Paul is preaching the gospel, everything that Jesus did, what we talked about earlier for for everyone, and and everyone's sitting there and they're like, well, this is awesome, but what do we do now? And Peter says, repent and turn to Jesus. Why? Because I need forgiveness for my sins. There's one more verse in John that I want to hit on, and I don't have it, so Kelsey, don't panic, but it's, it's, a, it's a few verses later, and it's, it's John 5, 14, and it says, Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something, may hap- something worse may happen to you. We can f- be fully physically healed on the outside, but we can still be a wreck on the inside. We can still be so far from Jesus, so broken, And following Jesus isn't a formula. I don't want to give that impression. I don't want to, I don't want to go back on everything I said earlier about like the self-help book and the John Mark Comer book. It's not a formula. But I think there is a way for us to enter into the presence of God. And I think that what we've learned is that the presence of God is a healing place. And the only place I truly will find what I'm looking for is in the presence of Jesus. And so this is my last personal story. But when I was 17... I was at the height of my pain, and it's also kind of the time where you're supposed to be deciding what you do with the rest of your life, which is so silly. Um, but something compelled me to go on a YWAM. And if you don't know what a YWAM is, it's, it's a, it stands for Youth with a Mission. So it's a discipleship training school. You go and you learn about Jesus and about missions for about three months, and then you go um, kind of live out those things in, in different countries for three months. And I was in the heart of Papua New Guinea, living in a village, and we were, we were teaching everything that we'd learned in our lecture phase to the people in the church there. 
And we're just giving this, one of my friends was giving a teaching on the Holy Spirit, and it was just a normal day. And I'd already, like, learned a lot about God and, like, kind of had the knowledge up here. I was doing my devotionals every morning, but I, my heart was still hard. My heart was still not changing. It's still, I wasn't letting God penetrate my heart. And so I went up for prayer. And this is kind of a weird thing to explain because it, it happened between me and God. I'm going to do my best. But I, I was sitting on the floor. My friends were praying for me. And I closed my eyes, and then everything around me went silent. And I, in my mind, I just knew I was sitting in the throne room of God. I was sitting at his feet. And I just, like, not, like no one said anything. No one was, like, praying fire over me or anything. It was just peaceful. I was just there with God. I couldn't hear anything happening around me. And there was a service going on. like this, And, and when, by the time I opened my eyes, everyone was gone. So I don't know how long I sat there for, but I just sat in the presence of God, and that changed me. Like, it wasn't this, like, I get prayed for, and I pass out, and, like, all of this crazy stuff. I was just in the presence of God. And it wasn't this, like, at first, it wasn't this overwhelming sense of guilt and shame that made me want to change. It was being in the presence of God and being like, you are so holy. You are so holy. And I don't want my preferences and my decisions and my sin patterns to ever keep me from being in the throne room of God. I don't ever want this distance again, Jesus. Like, I just want to live my life and I want to live it for you. And I just want to be obedient now. And, like, we're all, like, 18 YWAM students. Like, no one's explaining what's going on to me. But Jesus is gentle. He's a good father. Like, I get to encounter Jesus like that anytime I want. This encounter is what changed me from the inside out. It's what began my healing journey, and all it was was an act of surrender. And now I know that you, maybe if you've been in church before, you hear this all the time, but, like, I fall more and more in love with Jesus every single day. I just want more of him every day. I just want to get into his presence. And this is a journey, right? Like, I just told you I was 17. I'd been in church for 17 years. But it's also a choice. To say, Jesus, I trust you and I want to turn from my ways. I lied. I'm going to read one more verse. So right after this verse, when it talks about Jesus saying, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Verse 15 says, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And I don't know this man personally. I don't know his intentions behind this. But from my personal experience, what I can gather is that the moment he knew what Jesus was like, he just wanted to tell other people. He just wanted other people to experience what he'd experienced. And so first and foremost, our reason for following Jesus should just be because we love him and because he's good and because he's worthy. But sometimes we need a little kick, right? Like a little kick to get back on track. What if someone else could find Jesus because of your faith? What if someone's life could be changed because they've seen the way that your life has changed? And that's part of why I'm sharing my story today, right? But we all have a story. And so I just want, like, the call today. Sorry, Bob, I didn't even tell you to come up, but thank you for coming up. Um, the call today is to share our story. Testimony is just a fancy word for the things that God has done in my life. But let's begin to share the story of Jesus in our life and the way that he's, he's changed us. Can we stand this morning? I don't know if this is your first time here this morning. If you've been a Christian for most of your life or maybe you've been a Christian for 17 years. But you are so loved by God. And he just wants you in his presence. He wants to change you from the inside out. He is not in the business of behavior modification, but heart transformation. He wants to give you a new heart. And so we're just going to take a moment to pray this morning. And maybe this prayer is a response to the call of Jesus that you've heard the gospel and you're like, I want that. I want to start my journey. I want to, I want to surrender. Or maybe it's a rededication of your life. Or maybe it's just, I'm a Christian and I'm walking the walk, but it's getting hard. 
or it's been hard. I just wanna pray for us to experience more of Jesus and, and just encounter him in a new way. Is that okay? Holy Spirit, we just thank you for who you are. Just thank you that you are so near, that you're so present, God, that you care so much, that you sent your only son. God, and like this man, God, who's just full of hopelessness, God, we just pray for the person in this room that's hopeless today, who's just experienced so much pain, so much disappointment. God, we just invite you to just be there. Just be with them. God, just begin to bring healing. Begin to bring restoration, Lord. God, we just surrender to your will. God, we want to just let go of all of the things that we do for pain management, God. We want to be able to grab your hand and trust that as you take us through it, God, you are trustworthy. You are faithful. You're not going to leave us in our pain, God, but you're going to bring us through it. So, Father, we just love you. Thank you for what you're doing. We pray this in your name. Amen.